Good morning to everyone. I'm, my name is Marcello Scalisi. I'm the UNIMED uh, director and I have the pleasure to introduce this session dedicated uh, uh, um, an important priority of uh, our countries at the moment. It's not only a priority for the Euro-Mediterranean region to talk about tourism, but at the moment is a very important and challenging priority for all of us. For, uh, to try to answer to the needs of our uh, enterprises and tourism sector during the COVID-19. First of all, let me say also a few words about UNIMED. It is a network of Euro-Mediterranean universities. At the moment, we have 138 universities from 23 countries of both sides of the Mediterranean region. We have universities from the southern Mediterranean countries, from Morocco to Syria some university from the Gulf. Uh, we have new university in our network from Iraq, which is a quite challenging issue for us. Uh, we have also obviously the European Mediterranean countries from Portugal to Greece, and with few, several members also few from, from Italy. Obviously we are based in Italy, as you can understand from my very Italian English accent. And uh, we have also some participation from Albania and from Northern Europe, in particular from the Tampere University from Finland. UNIMED started in 1991, and this year we celebrate 30 years of activity and we are preparing several issues to celebrate these important anniversaries for associations like, uh, like UNIMED. Uh, what we do, we, obviously we try to encourage cooperation with un, within universities in, in the region, uh, considering that to enhance the, the economic, and cultural, cultural and social cohesion of the area, the university can play and has to have to play an important, an important role. Uh, as I said, we have 138 members from 23 countries. We have. Uh, uh, 15 memorandum of understanding with important institutions. Uh, we have now 12 sub networks that are in some ways working group inside of our network. Uh, 35 running projects financed by most of them by the European Commission related to the academic cooperation in the Euro Mediterranean region. And our team is composed of close to 20 people, most of them based there in, uh, in, uh, in Rome. Uh, three main priorities for us, three main strategic initiatives. Uh, first of all, we work to improve the autonomy of, of the higher education system in the region. As you know, uh, a university without the right uh, freedom, the right autonomy, is uh, probably is not uh, in, the, in, uh, in the capacity to act as a, as a player in, in their own local society. Then we try also to encourage universities to, to improve their cooperation among them, in particular in the southern Mediterranean countries, to create this regional integration. That unfortunately is not yet uh, one of our priority, uh, one of our main issues in the region. Uh, there is a lot, a lot of bilateral cooperation among southern Mediterranean countries and the European countries and the European Union, but there is a lack of inter cooperation among them. And another important pillar for us is the social responsibility of universities, uh, how to encourage universities to open the door to the society and also to act as uh, an important player for the uh, development of our uh, community. Um, we have some important uh, areas where we try to act, in particular uh, autonomy, as I mentioned, social responsibility, we are working a lot also in learning innovation. Uh, this was also independent by COVID-19 and now digitalization arrived in all our uh, dimension of our, of our life and in particular in education, but it's something that UNIMED is working in independently by this. Uh, then we have a, a very important activity on the role of our education in crisis situation. For instance, we wrote a, a very interesting report on the Libyan education system, but also we are working on refugees and migration issues, and then research and innovation, how to improve research and innovation in the Euro-Mediterranean countries. These are some units. I will go very fast on this. We work with, uh, with, our, mem with our staff, and obviously thanks to our members, 
on a specific unit related to the academic mobility, for instance, or how to improve students' engagement in university life, how to improve, of course, intercultural dialogue in the Euro-Mediterranean region, talking about universities, and as, as I said, migration and refugees and governance and so on. Uh, I mentioned our projects. We have uh, 35 projects, more or less. These are the topics where act uh, all our projects, governance, learning, innovation, refugees, and so on. And this, uh, the, uh, this project I mentioned is important, not only for the budget that obviously we have thanks to this project. In some case, we are coordinator, in some case, we are partner. But the most important issue is that projects are the way to do something concrete among us. Uh, and not only just to talk about the importance of the cooperation in the Euro-Mediterranean region. It's important that universities try to work together, to work on a common priorities, and to try to, through projects, obviously to identify some potential solutions. We do a lot of projects in terms of capacity building, how to transfer competencies from one place to another. But I have to say that this uh, capacity building dimension is not just in one direction. In every occasion that we manage project, there is a vice versa process. We move from one country to another but we learn each other, obviously, working together. Uh, as I mentioned, the sub-network, uh, uh, we decided to, some years ago, to launch this uh, uh, working group dimension to invite universities, not only to act through the International Relations Department, but also to, uh, to act in the Euro-Mediterranean cooperation through faculties, through departments and researchers, uh, to work on a common priorities that are important for, for our region. Obviously, the main idea is to exchange uh, uh, information, experiences, to, to identify potential common priorities, and why not to establish new collaboration and to launch new, eventually new uh, projects. Uh, these are uh, the sub-networks that we already launched. Mediterranean tourism is one of uh, them, and I consider it very, very important independently by COVID-19 situation, because the tourism could be and is a, a, an important economic priority for all of us in, around the world, but in particular could be in the, in the Mediterranean region, a key element for, for the stability of the region itself. Uh, we relaunched the sub-network on tourism in 2017. Uh, our model of working of the sub-network is to identify for every sub-network a coordinator, one of our members that is interested to coordinate the sub-network and a co-coordinator, normally is one from the south and the other one from Europe or vice versa. In this case, I'm very pleased to have with us the University of Jordan that is coordinator of this sub-network, jointly with the University of Girona. Uh, the University of Jordan is one of very uh, active member of UNIMED. Normally this year we will have our assembly in Amman. I don't know if we will be able to celebrate it. Could be in October or in December. We will see depending by the situation. And the University of Girona is one of the youngest member of UNIMED, but very, very active. And they are participating in, with us in uh, several activity and projects. And also they are coordinator of another sub-network on climate change. Uh, talking about UNIMED projects in, uh, in about related to tourism, we are, coordinate, we are partner of an important project in the Interreg MED program, which is a, a transnational project with European, just European uh, partners, European members. And this is important because we are working with different actors, uh, not few universities in this case, but also uh, organization, uh, regional organization like the Diputación de Barcelona, but also Plan Bleu, which is an important international organization, Nextdoor, which is another network of region, of European region working on tourism at the University of Tessali in Greece, in the Adriatic Union Euro region and the Rivia Green, cast from Slovenia, 
the main idea of this project is the main work of this project is to coordinate the efforts of many, many other projects, 22 in particular, that are developing measures and tools addressing the sustainability of tourism. You know that now, you know better than me, that sustainability of tourism remain of our, one of our key priority. Theoretically speaking, sometimes it's very easy to talk about this, but it's very difficult to practice. And I'm very uh, interested to know how our subnetwork could propose, in particular in a region where we're talking about tourism, we work on a different scale, on a different uh, approach, how we could invite both sides of the Mediterranean to work together on this concept of sustainability. I think that I can stop here with this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I will follow the activity of the, the workshop and in particular activity of the subnetwork to, to know more how we could cooperate on this very important priority. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we leave the floor to the coordinators, Professor Lazaide, followed by Professor Zara. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Emilia. Uh, just one second, give me one second to share uh, my PowerPoint. Uh, is, it, uh, is it clear right now? We see, okay, perfect. Okay. Just one second. So, uh, good morning all. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you today. Uh, uh, I will start, or I would like to thank all of you for being with us. Um, and uh, let me first uh, uh, thank the speakers who uh, are participating with us uh, today. Uh, my name is Mohamed al from the University of Jordan. Um, I am coordinating the, the tourism sub-network with Dr. Zerva from the University of uh, Girona. We work together to uh, um, manage and uh, coordinate this uh, sub-network. Uh, as Dr. Uh, Salisi mentioned that uh, tourism sector uh, is becoming one of uh, the, the fundamental factors for local development in the Mediterranean. So the Mediterranean tourism uh, sub-network actually uh, seeks to bring together research centers uh, university de departments, researchers, and academics who are working in the field of, uh, of tourism. In our sub-network, we aim to bring all of these people to foster scientific cooperation, exchange uh, the, the experience and the information, strengthen the partnership, and also to promote uh, new collaboration. Uh, <clears throat> right now, actually, we have um, 19 universities from nine countries. We have uh, an university from Algeria, we have from France, Italy, Jordan, Lebanon, Libya, Palestine, Portugal, and Spain. Um, all of these people are working together to, to, uh, to achieve the goals of uh, our uh, sub-network. We have uh, many plans. We have a lot of activities that uh, we are planning to, uh, to conduct or to do uh, this year. I don't have a lot of time to talk all of uh, about all of our activities, but I will mention some uh, uh, briefly. Some 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 of them. Uh, we have a lot of things to do this year. Uh, some activities uh, that we are planning is uh, to conduct meetings for the sub network members to strengthen uh, the collaboration uh, and networking between the, the members. Also. Uh, to improve the flow of knowledge uh, between researchers and professionals, uh, we are planning uh, also for organizing two thematic uh, webinars. Uh, we are now still uh, working in these webinars. We don't know, <coughs> or we did not identify uh, specific topics for, uh, for these uh, webinars. Uh, um, also, we will produce newsletters with contribution of all members. Uh, as uh, as I mentioned, I, I don't have a lot of time to talk about the, the, uh, the, the all activities that we are planning to do, but uh, I hope you will enjoy this webinar. 
our first webinar for the Soap Network of Tourism. And now, <coughs> and now I will leave the, the mic for Dr. Zerva to uh, welcome the speakers and start the presentations. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Um, good morning from my part. I'm Costantina Zerva from the University of Girona. Um, basically, I'm going to do a very small introduction of the topic of the webinar that we are starting today in this sub network. Um, you've seen all the title, Crisis Management During the COVID Era, uh, the Experience of the Mediterranean Tourism Sector. Uh, throughout this last year that we have this pandemic, um, the word webinar has become very famous and many, many webinars have taken place and are still taking place. Uh, especially regarding the tourism sector, which has been highly hit uh, from this pandemic. Um, so many topics have been discussed with many worries regarding uh, destination management or accommodation, uh, the new uh, tourism profile, new tourism experiences, virtual tourism, uh, concepts of risk perception, and generally global strategies for tourism management during this, uh, during this pandemic. Um, so we see that generally the adaptation of the tourism sector is of high concern and we still do not have a lot of certainty about what is going to happen and therefore the discussion, the academic discussion is ongoing. Uh, on the other hand, we are on the Mediterranean uh, subnetwork and the Mediterranean territory and area generally is a worthy representative of what has been mentioned a lot lately as a tourism crisis management uh, situation especially during the last 20 years because considering uh, the economic crisis that we had uh, from 2008 uh, the refugee crisis uh, terrorist attacks in various countries in the mediterranean and now the pandemic it seems that the mediterranean area has a lot to say about uh, tourism management and crisis management uh, even though still tourism is a very important element uh, and a very important industry in the Mediterranean, but it is reshaping its way of existing. So it is very important to see how in this actual situation, this reshaping is happening and what kind of strategies different countries have applied or are applying. So for this reason, uh, we have uh, asked, um, through their expertise and academic and professional experience, we have invited experts from various countries and professional realities to share with us their knowledge and predictions about the future of tourism in the Mediterranean uh, territory. So to start with the guests that we have today, um, we would like, of course, to um, thank and invite our first guest, which is Professor Dimitrios Buhalis, Buhalis uh, one of uh, the most cited professors and academics in the tourism sector. He is a strategic management and marketing expert with specialization in information communication technology applications in the tourism, travel, hospitality and leisure industries. He's director of the eLab, a tourism lab, and deputy director of the International Center for Tourism and Hospitality Research at Bournemouth University Business School in England. Uh, and also from April 2010, he was promoted to what is usually called as distinguished professor in other universities, professor number two. There is this is a very short version of your CV, so uh, I would like now to uh, give the mic to you. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Costadina Sabahri. Uh, buenos dias, buongiorno, uh, bon dia, alegria. I forgot the Portuguese colleagues earlier on. Great to be in the Mediterranean network from Mediterranean England. This is Bournemouth uh, Beach, and uh, it's very Mediterranean, especially when the, the sun is out. Uh, great to be with you, and I'd like to uh, share with you some of the latest developments on the research that we are uh, developing in Bournemouth University and explain what I see, how I see technology and smart tourism in particular, uh, helping the tourism to go out of uh, the crisis. Now, Mediterranean tourism, uh, as some people who know I'm Greek, so I've spent most of my life caring about uh, Greek tourism, but also I've done a lot of work in Egypt, uh, work with the government in Egypt some years ago. I've done work everywhere in Spain. Um, so I'm very, very close to most of the Mediterranean region. Now, um, just the promotional bit, I'm finishing the Encyclopedia of Tourism Management and Marketing, and I'm editing the tourism uh, review, which have got enough information about these things. I think this is the most critical uh, graph that it has taken me about 35 years to, to develop. And basically, when we're trying to understand tourism, we need to understand tourism on, on, in a holistic way. 
So here you've got the tourism system where you've got traveling regions, you've got the tourism destination regions, and you've got the transit region. And you've got resources coming in and value creation coming out. So this is what we call the tourism system. Now, the tourism system requires the basis, and this is the pyramid, and a lot of my colleagues in Egypt will recognize that. Uh, and it is about planning management strategy. It's about understanding market forces. It's about understanding all the exogenous variables that they are changing our environment. And it's about the technologies and the infrastructure that create the info uh, space where we operate. So this is part of my introduction to the encyclopedia and my statement, but I think this is the epitome of tourism science and the developments that we've got so far. And this year, because a lot of people have got an opinion about tourism, I had to bring them back to, uh, to, to tell them exactly where are they referring and how does it all get together? Because if you're taking one bit of this, the balance, uh, the balance goes and therefore uh, the tourism industry is getting off balance. Now, um, I don't need to tell you that, but COVID has been a crisis unlike any other. We had 3 million people dying around the world. We have uh, millions and millions of people who have been affected in their lives. So when you're looking to uh, Europe and the Mediterranean, on, at least on the north side, uh, you see how many uh, people we have actually lost and how many lives um, have been taken away. Uh, the message I'd like to give you is that it's not over yet. I'm afraid that it isn't. And um, what you see is that it goes in waves and you see in different periods, um, it's, it's really uh, getting worse. And after Christmas, it was probably the time that we were losing more people than ever before. It's not over yet. Uh, we all very tired. We'd all like to go back to 2019, but this is not over yet. And you can see what's happening here in terms of where um, uh, uh, things are changing. And, and, and you can see the UK is actually improving dramatically because of the vaccines and because of different other things. But you can see Brazil going really, really bad right now. India is coming next. And Hungary, for some reason, is, doing, is not doing very well. We need to understand this uh, on, the, on the background in order to be able to move forward. It's a war. And it's really... During wars, you've got casualties and a lot of a lot of things are destroyed. And these are our, our heroes. These are the people who have been giving the battles on the front line. And we've lost a lot of these battles. Um, we really want to go back to 2019 and to see uh, the growth that we're experiencing. And you can see that tourism is very resilient. Uh, you can see we had uh, 20... Uh, 30 fantastic years that um, the curve was growing and growing and growing, even at the most difficult kind of situations like SARS or the economic crisis in 2009, um, tourism was very, very resilient. Now, the WTO is kind of predicting that we are either going to be minus 55 on a good scenario or minus 67 on, on a bad scenario uh, for 2021. I think we start need to realize it that we don't need to go back to 2019. 2019 is gone. We really need to start thinking about 2022, 23, with the horizon of 2030. What has happened in the last year, year and a half, there has been a lot of transformation on people on how they live, how they behave, how they engage, how they communicate. Digitization has gone really, really fast. And I think we're going to a very different industry from what we left in 2019. And if we are really honest with ourselves, do we really like all the things that we're doing in 2019? We probably didn't. And I'm not talking about all this kind of um, talk that's coming out about slow tourism, sustainable tourism, and things like that, because a lot of people have just, have just um, discovered these things. But we need to do them in a clever way to, to, to provide sustainability for our communities. We really need to take our um, measures and strategies to, to look after our communities. Now, this is uh, a familiar uh, picture to many of you. This is Bournemouth University with a lot of British Airways flights, uh, 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 aircraft being parked there. Uh, and this is what's happening on the front line. People are really doing heroic uh, uh, efforts to actually 
recover and start again. These are my heroes and you see them around the world. And actually not only they are offering tourism services, but they're doing a whole range of different things to support uh, the medical people and those people in need. Uh, the, there's a restaurant in London that just um, have donated 100,000 meals to people in need and to the medical, uh, the medical professions. So from the beginning of uh, the COVID, I came up with the brace, brace, brace. And because a lot of the industry was kind of didn't really understand where we're going. And nobody really believed that it's going to be a year and we're still going to be dealing with these things. Um, but I said from the beginning, we really need to start looking into humanity, solidarity, leadership and resilience. And I've done it in Greek as well because I was doing a lot of seminars in, Greeks, in, in, in Greece to, to support my Greek colleagues. But it's really about humanity and solidarity. How can we support people and all the people in need in this kind of area? We need leadership. And we need leadership that's looking on the long term and understand what humanity is about. And we need resilience. And we need to understand all the, all the statistics. We need to understand in a smart way what's happening. Now, there's light at the end of the tunnel because quite often they tell me you need to be more optimistic. I said, I, I prefer to be realistic. Uh, and uh, we have got several different kind of ways of dealing with that. And we know what to do. Uh, the vaccination, there is a race of vaccinations and you'll see the statistics in a minute. And you see, uh, as soon as we've got our vaccines, we're gonna get out of the way. When you look at the vaccination rates and the, and, and the, and, and the race, um, you see that Israel is very much ahead. They, they had 119% uh, vaccination, then United Arab Emirates, then Chile, Bahrain, UK, and then Europe is about 25, 25%, Greece 24, I think Spain is 27. We really need to take that uh, fast forward as soon as we can, and we also need to prioritize uh, the tourism people who are on the front line. We also need to become much more democratic as far as uh, vaccination is concerned. Until everybody is vaccinated, we are not safe. Uh, Boris Johnson just announced in the UK that any flight that's coming through Dubai and United Arab Emirates is going to be on the red list because these hubs will be the absolute critical hubs that there'll be a lot of people going through there. So it doesn't matter if in fact you are coming from Dubai back to the UK because you may be coming from a very infected area and just transferring in Dubai. So we really need to make sure that until everybody is vaccinated and we've got immunity around the world, uh, we've, got, we've got an issue. Now, there's some good news that domestic uh, tourism is booming in several places. And I know that people will be crying in Spain and in Greece and in several other places to say, look, the domestic tourism is not enough to sustain our business. We all know that. But I think we really need to do what we can do and survive. It's survival for the time being, it's resilience, okay? So take whatever you can from the communities and the markets that are close to you. This is uh, Bournemouth. Uh, the British people, they're just realizing how beautiful Bournemouth is. And actually it is very beautiful if the weather is good. If the weather is not very good, it's beautiful in another way. And then we've got the new forest that's next to us. Greece is getting ready too. And uh, this is what they are promoting. All you want is Greece, we know that, but, but um, I'm telling you, in a cheeky way, because I know that uh, many people would like to go to Spain. I'd love to go to Egypt and to some of my friends. And this is something else that um, a friend is promoting in Greece. They're just, they are just uh, looking about the cherry roots and the flowers that are coming out of the cherries. And they are just bringing the domestic tourists out to move around as much as they can to look into new attractions. Think about innovation. Think about what can you do and how you can engage with these things. I said earlier, governments need to prioritize aviation for access to vaccination. And Singapore is doing that already. So Singapore Airlines, all their crews are vaccinated and a lot of other areas are doing that. There's a big discussion about the vaccination passports. And I think passports are a big word, but a kind of certificate, the Greek prime minister brought that forward. And um, these are my three passports really. And I keep, I keep traveling with them. And especially when you're going to African countries, you need uh, yellow fever vaccination, several other things. We've got what it, it takes and we need to do it. 
after the storm, there's always uh, a rainbow. And I think those people who survive are those people who are capable to have a very strong competitive advantage and they've got the opportunity to actually move forward. And I think one of the things with, with COVID is it doesn't take our assets away. The assets are there, our product, our brand, the co-creation opportunities are there and the experience that we can create. I think a lot of people start realizing how absolutely essential tourism is, both for customers and for, uh, um, and for uh, industry and regional development. But I think it's critical to understand that we're not going back, we're going forward. Um, the, 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 the past is becoming irrelevant. We're seeing the end of planning and the beginning of agility. And agility needs smartness and, and agility in terms of understanding what's happening and act very, very quickly. Some of you may be familiar with my research on smart tourism and it's really smart tourism takes advantage of interconnectivity and interoperability of integrated technologies to re-engineer process using big data effectively. So it's network optimization. And you see here several publications. I don't have the time to go through each of them, but, but please uh, have a look. And what we do is we're trying to create networks that they can deal with reality in real time. So one of the things that we're doing now is real-time resilience, understanding how we can go in real time and actually co-create value given the circumstances. We don't choose the circumstances. The circumstances are what they are, right? Uh, but we need to understand them in order to take advantage of those. And it's really about looking to how we can take technologies to synthesize innovations and bring them in the marketplace as soon as possible to, to facilitate individuals to take advantage of the situation they've got. Please have a look on the publications because we are explaining a lot of those things. Now, as far as technology is concerned, you have seen a lot of trust, uh, um, trace together, track and trace, all these kind of applications. And some countries, uh, especially in Asia and China in particular, is very advanced with these things. And uh, they came up with green codes. And um, if you had a green code, you can go along and do different things. Otherwise, you were restrained. I know that many of us in Mediterranean countries, uh, we are much more free to do different things and we are much more difficult to control, but we will need somehow to, to control ourselves. So this is the digital green certificate that the European uh, uh, Commission is bringing out where you need to have um, the two vaccines or you need a negative test or you need to have recovered from COVID. So you've got ammunition so you can you'll be able to uh, to travel one of the things with the passports is that um because it's quite difficult to actually create paper passports and things like that i think what increasingly is going to happen is that uh, the gds the global distribution systems will have layers and and i of of information and one of these layer will be health information nayata is developing um, the travel pass application and it's used uh, extensively now. It's being piloted and it's being extensively by various airlines, uh, New Zealand and different people. Singapore Airlines 308 on the 17th of March was the first flight, the first passenger using an IATA travel pass that arrived in London, didn't have to quarantine. So technology will be um, bringing different kinds of things. It's going to be seamless but people will need to accept that and people will need to engage. Now, technology will also enable us to control different things of, of our uh, environment in terms of you know, controlling television, controlling menus, ordering food, and doing a lot of these things. In fact, this is not coming because of COVID. Those of you who have traveled in China, you would realize that this is a reality and it was a reality two years ago. But what's happening is becoming much faster all over the world because of, of COVID, because of the digitization is progressing. And gradually, we're going to get to situations where you're going to have self-driving cars, drones, and autonomous kind of uh, things using artificial intelligence to move around. And some of these things, we are looking to my new book on gamification for tourism, because what we'll do is we'll need to find new ways of explaining the destination and engaging with people using technology and gamification is a fantastic methodology for doing that. So we are gonna be uh, able to actually um, engage the customers in real experience using all kinds of uh, new technologies. 
And as I said, these are not a lot of, uh, these are not new things. This is when we're traveling, I was in Hanzhou in China, and this is my best friend, this little robot here was following me around, could speak English, and we had conversations. Um, the Chinese um, staff didn't have the same level of English competence. And that is often the case in Spain, in Egypt, and many other countries. So you really need to think out of the box. And you need to think how we are going forward to 2022, 23, and 2030 in, in the longer term. Plan for the worst, hope for the best, and be smart and be agile. Um, I've tried to pack quite a lot of things in here. There are a lot of publications I wish you uh, you have the time to actually go through and engage with some of these publications where we're explaining several of the, these things. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Buchalis, for your contribution uh, and all the information you have given. Um, I would like to ask all the attendants and uh, people who are uh, here in the, in the webinar to put their questions in the chat so that we can ask directly at the end uh, every presenter uh, your questions. Um, so uh, thank you very much once again. And now I would like to go on to the next uh, presenter, the next uh, professor we have invited. And going from north to south, now we would like to invite Professor Islam Salem, who has a PhD in hotel management from Alexandria University and is associate professor at the Faculty of Tourism and Hotels in Alexandria University in Egypt and at the University of Technology and Applied Sciences in Oman. Um, he has done research related to hospitality leadership, hospitality marketing, technology, hotels outsourcing, and human resources. And recently, he has done an investigation regarding the role of government in the hotel sector in Egypt as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Professor Salem, uh, good morning from my part too. Uh, please start whenever you can. Good morning, Prof. Zerfa. Thank you for your introduction. And thank you, Professor Bahalis, for your amazing uh, uh, discussion here and, uh, and amazing uh, presentation. Uh, let's share our presentation here uh, from mine. Is it clear now? Yes. Okay, good morning all of you. Uh, how much I am very pleased to be with you and to join this discussion uh, and absolutely thank a big thank to the UNIMED for organizing this, uh, this webinar. Uh, I am going to talk about here about Egyptian hotels, specifically it's not a big umbrella as a tourism. So uh, if we have from my section, I am going to talk about here overview about Egypt and then what about the initiative from uh, the government and what about the practices from hotels itself and about recommendations from recent studies, which I already have taken this year. Uh, so uh, as we know here for the coronavirus disease, uh, pandem pandemic has had a destructive economic impact all over the world with a matched universal travel restrictions since World War II. Uh, we can find tourism is an important pillar for MENA area here and accounting around uh, 5.3 of GDP uh, and we have 6.7 million jobs across this region. In Egypt specifically, we have around 1 million worker in tourism industry. Uh, globally, uh, as we know, uh, all of us know, hotel occupancy rates have been dramatically affected since the onset of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, if we have overview about Egypt here, we can see in 2019-2020, uh, uh, Egypt tourism revenues uh, in 2020 decreased 70% to a $4 billion, as the number of travelers to the country fell from 13 million in 2019 to 3.5 million last year. And uh, tourism accounts for GDP of Egypt around 15%. Uh, here for this year, for three months, for the first three months of 2021, we already have 500 thousand tourists only and we have revenues between 600 million to 800 million however uh, egypt's hotel uh, capacity stands a uh, 205 thousand room and is set to expand 215 rooms by the end of 2021 an increase of 4.8 percent this is how tourism will be uh, recovered uh, soon 
for instruction for visiting Egypt nowadays, uh, all travelers can enter Egypt, providing the negative, uh, the, the negative PCR test. Alternatively, uh, those arriving in coastal governments like South Sinai, Red Sea, and the Mars Matruh, who cannot show evidence of a negative test, but they can provide, okay, they, think they can take a test with a certain dollar. Uh, they, uh, if this, they have a positive, they can isolate for 14 days in dedicated area of their hotel. So let's go here for uh, the, Egyptian, the Egyptian government initiatives. What about the most initiated here from the government side? We have many here, which the government plays a critical role during COVID-19. If we are talking about the first stage here, they were providing grants, subsidies, physical assistance, interest-free loans, flexibility of loan programs, health information, guidance on protection methods for hotels and their employee, and the funds for retaining staff here. But if we are, if we are talking about a specific period here, for example, from if we are talking about uh, the period from uh, March till June 2020, we have here some initiatives. This initiative is related to major areas. These areas are financial policies, health and hygiene, workforce and the training, promotion, roles for hotels to start domestic tourism. If, for example, going into financial policies, what about the role of government here? The role of government here, okay, a lot, which they already has postponing payments without fine exempting paying the rent, postponing utility payments, minimizing uh, the real uh, state taxes and others. The most important for health and hygiene, they have many, many areas, okay, or many lines under health and hygiene, like obligating hotels to implement disinfecting practices and to follow WHO guidelines handbook. And also they have other companies like SGS and the Crystal to make, uh, to make here a uh, discussion for anything related to these points. For, work, for, for workforce and the training, we have hotline for complaints and encouragers, setting the strict penalties against illegal treatment of workforce, training of employee about reactionary and preventive practices. For promotion as one component of marketing, they already have motivating the traveling to Upper Egypt. We are talking here about domestic tourism, and we have an, an initiative there. Try, okay, we have, have to have a winter in Egypt. So have a winter in Egypt is one initiative there, and they have discounts on entry fees to archaeological sites and for also reducing the visa fees upon arrival at airports of Luxor and Aswan launching marketing campaigns on social media and publishing virtual tours inside museums and publishing virtual tours inside archaeological sites. For the roles of hotels to start domestic tourism here, as I said here, we have one great initiative for encouraging and supporting people in Egypt to have, to have a winter in, for example, in upper of Egypt and for coastal, coastal cities. So let's go here for hotels practices to manage COVID-19. For hotels themselves, they have many appreciative here. If we are, they have many areas related to workforce, check and process, restaurants, pools and the beach, fitness center and the spa, housekeeping and the laundry, safety and the hygiene, and the marketing strategies also. For all this and for others, they already have here mean, if we are talking before recommendation, here, what about hotel practices here, the main practices, for example, for the workforce. For the workforce here, we, the, the, the hotels are reducing employee wages and pay rates. That is okay, reality giving. And giving the staff mandatory vacations and reducing the staff. That is not only in Egypt, but all over the world, I think that's happened. And requiring employee to undertake additional duties, replacing permanent employee with part with part ones and the communicating regularly uh, with all personnel. For if we are talking about check-in process, we have some procedures for check-in process like 
uh, installing disinfection both uh, at the hotel entrance, finalizing check-in procedures electronically or with single use pens. Also, they have disinfecting the guest luggage before entering and leaving this hotel, measuring the temperature of guests upon entering the hotel, and we have others, for example, even discovering a positive case among, among guests, the hotel to inform Ministry of Health to coordinate the isolation of this case and a dedicated, okay, dedicated area in the hotel or hospital based on the severity of the case and according to the instructions of the Ministry of Health. So let's go for restaurants. For restaurants, self-restaurants at Pofi are not allowed and not allowed here, measuring the temperatures of our restaurant's guests, leaving a minimum distance of two meters between tables, one meter between each, uh, each person per, per table, considering the families by providing a maximum of six chairs per table and other uh, procedures for restaurants. For poles and the beach here, we have also guidelines for poles and beach and how to use this, this poles and the beaches. Here we can find regular, maintain, regular maintenance and its infection of the poles and using a maximized chlorine, for example, leaving a two meter distance between each sun bed, delivering used uh, bed towels uh, in the rooms to minimize human contact and minimizing entertainment activities on the beach and, and poles. For fitness center and spa, we have also some guidelines here for fitness center and the spa, like disinfecting all touch touch ball areas on hourly basis and entire fitness center after the use of guests here while maintaining the proper distance between the equipment. Showering at the gym facility is not allowed here. Jacuzzi, sauna, steam, massage are not allowed also. Cleaning and disinfecting or disinfecting all bathrooms within the fitness center facility on hourly basis and the clothing in the shower area. Outside, guests are not allowed to enter a hotel or for spa, sorry. For housekeeping and, and laundry here, disinfecting rooms daily using policy procedures and following the Ministry of Health instructions, cleaning and disinfecting all touch for areas also for handling. And, you, and we know what about the, the crucial role of housekeeping, how to make everything clean and sanitized. This is very important. So laundering, linen and beach towels using a high temperature and disinfecting the laundry machines. And we have interactive and innovative equipment nowadays for, for housekeeping. Uh, the important point here are it's about safety and hygiene. For safety and hygiene, all hotels in Egypt follow the instructions and the guidance of WHO handbook, which was already published in August 2020. And besides this, the Ministry of Health obligated all hotels to have another company to monitor what about the safety, the hygiene in these hotels and we have a health certificate per each hotel when they follow all these instructions. Almost of, of hotels in Egypt have already contracted with SGS companies, crystal companies for hygiene, sanitation and food safety. And these practices were applied not only for back of the house, for, for front of guests to reassure them they will enjoy a cleaner and safety and safer, safer stay. And the hotels acted their emergency procedures, perform health screening of staff and implement cleanliness and the disinfection protocols. We have continuous hygienic training, health and safety procedures and the food and beverage safety programs in accordance with the current food safety recommendations also applied here. Hotels installed new hygiene equipment Special and filters, chemical uh, sterilizers, masks, and the gloves also all happened here. Hotels provided the necessary, the necessary products such as disinfecting products here and hand sanitizer and facial tissues and others for all guests and employees to take accordingly. For marketing strategies here, uh, all hotels or almost all hotels in Asia to try to change the strategy of marketing for if we are talking about marketing mix, product price, place and promotion. So they started to be out of borders, out of their inside cycle. They are using nowadays online sales tools to provide their products to all community with applications and the platforms. They started to, to sell their, their food and the beverages 
to all community with their applications. Hotels implemented marketing strategies targeting in new market segments, promoting the marketing and advertising campaigns, providing more discounted rates, providing special offers for different services, focusing on loyal customers and using electronic marketing and, and distribution channels here and building social, social customer relationships. Digitalization also is very important how artificial intelligence is very important and to have nowadays because of COVID-19 to have uh, robots or gamification as Dr. Um, Professor Pohali said here for this is very important nowadays and this is the reality. So here digital products and how uh, to participate with a specialist in ecosystem are some of the important strategies to face this pandemic. Then here uh, we have recommendation to manage uh, COVID-19 and hotels. Based in our studies, we have studies for this. We can find some of this uh, recommendation. Uh, if I am talking specifically for Egypt here, we have to create a professional union or sign syndicate for workers in tourism and the hospitality sector because they suffered a lot. And this is not the only one suffer. They suffered a lot because of different crises happened to Egypt and for hospitality industry before, and they don't have professional union. So it's very important and recommended to have professional, uh, your professional syndicate or union for workers to protect their rights. And it will be a great idea if we have, uh, if we have creating a crisis or emergency box for uh, for this hotel, which can help them. Also, installing, installing in new technologies such as electrostatic sprayers with dysmectic mist or ultraviolet light is very important here. Hotels could compensate their employee in future post-pandemic days with additional rewards and the promotional promotional chains, providing incentive and promotional opportunities for employee to satisfy them. It can be we have not enough salaries for them, and but we can we can do it for future. And how can reward them and to minimize or can be frozen? So government should provide funding for advertising and the launching and promotional campaigns. So it is very important here. Recent technologies are very important nowadays, and how to cross how to minimize cross contamination risk and interpersonal contact and enhance customer trust in the service environment. This is very important here. Finally, okay, this is the two studies which already published in 2021. For all this, okay, if you would like to know much more information about Egypt and about uh, all crises, you will know, you will, you will have here implications and results here for related to this study. Thank you for your uh, attention and for more information, please contact me. This is my email and hopefully hospitalize all of you in Egypt soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Salem. It would be a pleasure to go to Egypt, uh, especially after one year of not being able to go anywhere. So that would be amazing for all of us. Um, please, everyone that has a question can uh, add it to the chat and then we will do it uh, later on at the end of uh, all presentations. Now we would like to move on uh, to another part of the Mediterranean, a little bit more northern Egypt, and we go to Spain. And we would like to invite Professor Italo Arbulu from the University of Palearic Islands. Uh, specialized in applied economics and public policies. His recent investigation has focused on a topic that has previously, previously been mentioned in the Mediterranean area that has to do with domestic tourism uh, in time of facing the COVID uh, era in the, in, in the COVID tourism industry crisis. So, uh, Professor Arbulu, welcome. Good morning. Thank you very much, Constantina. Um, I'm going to share the screen, so hopefully it's going good. Is it good? Yes, it's good. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you to Professor Bohalis and Professor Salem for such good presentations. Um, I would like to start uh, this presentation. Again, uh, thank you for the invitation. It's an honor for me to, to share uh, the findings of a recent research I made with some of my colleagues from the University of the Balearic Islands, uh, Professor Francesc Sastre, Javier Rey Maqueira, and Maria Rasmova. 
hopefully this uh, research is going to be published soon. So uh, let's go to the, okay. So as it, been, as it has been said, uh, tourists has been exposed to several health crises in the past, like SARS, Ebola, or MERS. However, this disease did not have uh, an impact uh, in a global, a significant global impact, only at regional or country levels. So uh, the main thing with, with COVID is that uh, we have global impacts. So this is an unprecedented scale uh, event. So we have uh, an event that is obviously affecting the world economy and particularly the, the tourist sector. So, uh, which is the main problem with this. So with, in times of such unstable, unstable context, uh, we need public intervention. We need public policies that will help us to overcome these problems. The main problem is that we need to make a good forecasting. And the other problem is that uh, tourism is a complex sector. So a small change in one parameter in this, in this uh, complex system will make a huge impact on different variables. So what we did was to make a forecast analysis based on several different scenarios. Okay. Uh, okay. So the main idea here is that tourist industry is highly sensitive to crisis and disasters. Uh, but in this case, the main focus of academic research has been on exogenous risk and natural or social, sociopolitical disasters. But in this case, we have a health hazard, which obviously is affecting uh, the, tourist, the tourist flow. And this means that uh, the damage to the flows would produce production losses, supply chain disruptions, macroeconomic feedback, and mainly long-term consequence for economic growth. And why uh, tourists is so exposed to this kind of, of oh, I'm sorry, to health crisis? Uh, because the, the nature of the system. First, uh, many tourist workers require proximity to, the, to provide their services. Uh, second, tourist is centered on movement and social interaction. So we have a higher risk of contagious during this uh, movement. In the third case, we have also that it's a uh, highly labor intensity and most of these uh, activities cannot be performed remotely. Okay. And in the fourth, uh, the fourth uh, idea is that the policies that control virus propagation, like lockdowns, uh, has been useful to reduce, to, to control the virus spread. But in these policies, the tourist, the tourist sector is not considered as an uh, essential sector. It's not an essential sector. Okay. So uh, in this figure, uh, well, we took it from a study from Rio Chanona, and that it's for the United States, but it's useful to, to see the idea uh, about demand and supply shocks regarding to pandemic. As you can see in this, this part of the, of the figure, most of, this, of these activities belong to uh, the tourist sector. Okay, so uh, the main concentration of the activities are in the third quadrant. And this shows that the tourist sector is highly, um, high, highly, uh, has, ah, I'm sorry, <laughs> has, uh, um, da, 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 
has high risk from the supply side and the demand side according to this virus. Okay, so another thing that is important to highlight during this, during this, um, in this, in this graph, is that many of these professions uh, has a lot of stress during the high uh, seasonality. It's a high seasonal industry, so we have a problem here because uh, there's an additional risk. If uh, contagious policies like lockdown, for example, are close to high season, this risk can increase, obviously. Okay. Um, so what we did for this for this uh, research was to analyze what will happen to Balearic Islands economy uh, in the case of COVID. 19. Uh, so when we start this this research, we had a lot of uncertainty about several factors. Uh, the first one was to understand what would be the effect of fear in tourist arrivals, fear of contagious, and not only how deep will be this impact, but also how long will be this impact. On the other side, we also know that COVID-19 will lead to, uh, to, obviously, to an economic crisis, which will lead to an income reduction. So we will also like to know which would be the impact of the income loss on tour tourist arrivals to Balearic Islands. And third, we use four different scenarios of social distance policies. And we use these kind of uh, scenarios because uh, social distance policies not only uh, depend on what Balearic government will do, but also about uh, what other immediate regions will do as well. So we check for an alternative a scenario of a severe lockdown, um, another a scenario taking into account only domestic tourism, another scenario with safety corridors to one of the main tourist markets like Germany and another to uh, United Kingdom. Okay, so we took data from different studies to understand or to have uh, empirical distributions on income elasticities, on the expected GDP fall, and also with external shocks, and how long does the effect of fear uh, uh, taken in other kind of diseases, like which are not exactly COVID, but also to other diseases, and what what were these effects on other destinations? So we made a simulation on tourist arrivals, and then to the expected uh, tourist expenditure to fall. And we use this fall in an input-output model to get the impact on gross value added and on employment. So these are our simulations. We started with, uh, with a base a scenario in 2019, and we make simulations for in in the four different scenarios for from 2020 to 2022 in the four alternative severe lockdown which would be the worst case scenario to uh, alternative d which is the, the the positive scenario we use these tourist arrivals and with these simulations we uh, we could capture with what would be the impact on GDP, on the Balearic GDP, according to the input-output tables. So uh, our best case scenario show a reduction in gross value added for around 25%, and in the worst case scenario to 
22, uh, 32% approximately for the year 2020. And we have also the same uh, simulations for the 2000, for 2021. So um, the main idea behind this is that uh, this kind of simulations are really useful to analyze uh, situations of high uncertainty. And this kind of, 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 of methodology it's useful to, to calculate the same impacts on other destinations. Uh, the results are useful also for the Balearic government to understand not only what would be the impact on the whole GDP, but also which other sectors would be affected as well for uh, COVID-19. So you can take some special policies like ERTES, um, I'm going to go back just to show you, but not only the impact on the total gross value added, but also which other sectors in the Balearic economy would be affected as well. So with this kind of information, you can take better decisions. Why? Because in, the, in Spain, we have something that's called ERTE. So if you know how this impact will be spread along uh, other economic sectors, you will have uh, the possibility to make better protection measures. Uh, according to the results, a scenario B, which is just domestic tourists, uh, shows that Actually, it's, a, it's an important driver for destination resilience, as Professor Buhalis highlighted in his presentation. And on the other side, on the other side, scenarios C and D shows that the, there's a considerable impact for tourist recovery regarding to safe corridors. A scenario C was safe corridor with Germany and the scenario D was a safety corridor with Germany and United Kingdom, just to remember this. So uh, when we make this kind of simulations, we show the impact of uh, generating a safety corridor with emitting regions. But as we know, uh, the safety corridors are not easy to, to generate so it depends not only of uh, disease control measures at the destination, but also of disease control measures and the, at the emitting region. Uh, well, that's it. I try to stick a little bit to the time. So hopefully you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Arbulu, for your presentation and for explaining uh, your predictions and what's going to happen in the Balearic Islands. Once again, we will have uh, questions at the end of all presentations. So uh, finally, last but not least, and in order to provide uh, a less academic and more probably business point of view, we are pleased to introduce uh, Mr. Luis Falcón Martínez de Marañón, who is co-founder and CEO of the uh, ICT company in Atlas in 2000. 2010 specialized on big data and location analytics with offices around Spain and in Portugal. He's also a professor, associate professor in various universities and institutions like the Institute of Advanced Architecture of Catalonia, uh, the University of Lleida, and the Polytechnic University of Catalonia School of Professional and Executive Development in Barcelona. So, uh, Mr. Falcón, welcome, good morning, buenos dias, and please, whenever you feel ready. Well, welcome, Constantina. I, I will also try to fit on time, which is always very difficult indeed. Uh, but I will be—I will try to be polite with you all. Uh, so I will measure my time. <laughs> um, first of all, I mean, to, to thank you all of you very much for this invitation. And, and uh, I feel an outsider, right? Uh, uh, the previous uh, talk has been very uh, delightful for me. You know, uh, it, it gave to me some information. It was a little bit spoiling my presentation. It's always happened when you're the last. 
uh, but I have learned quite a lot, um, and I think we try to adapt to them. Um, I go for that. I, I, I definitely I will make an overview, you know, of how I see, you know, the the, the topic on the table of crisis. What it means, crisis for me, and how we face that, you know, um, 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 what the information I'm going to show, the insights mainly are coming from, right? I will share also the, the screen. Right. So, do you see my presentation? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I will keep the faces here because I like to see how the people smile. And um, that's very helpful. Um, right. I, I call my pitch uh, uh, crisis strategies versus contingencies, right? Because uh, I think we are in a time of, of, of contingencies, right? That's exactly how we face this crisis, which is not the sale of the previous crisis we have had. But, uh, but I think well, when we always have a crisis, we have to face that with the strategies. And the strategies are not designed from today or the last year on. I mean, they are being built since many years ago. So I don't think we have to do anything new or different that we have been or trying to be doing the last year for those who have been trying to do it well, of course, right? Um, so I call it the, the pitch of tourism, a new paradigm, right? Yeah, let me see if this works. It does, right? Uh, I, I, I brought it this uh, uh, slide that you also show somehow the professor uh, 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 show a, a, a very interesting one that it was showing exactly how in 2021, you know, this is going to be the only time ever, or this is the only time ever that the, the uh, uh, constant growth that we have from 60s, which is 4% average in a year, it has been affected to uh, 2021 because we have down a lot, you know, to, to a, a minus almost 80%, which is totally unprecedented. The previous people have been talking about that, so I will not go long, but uh, keep into account what's happened, you know, in mobility, on 2008, right, which affected, you know, just slightly, you know, tourism, but also, you know, in, in, in 1933, you know, when the federal crisis we had, this almost didn't touch, you know, the growth. So tourism is not in crisis, right? The crisis is territorial, you know, as the uh, Professor Arbulu uh, mentioned, right? It's territorial, you know, because indeed tourism work as a thermodynamic system. You know, when there is a crisis and well, the people go somewhere else, the people move mainly based on three things. The first thing is simply population. As the population grow, tourism grow. The second thing is middle class. As the middle class growth, tourism growth. And the third are uh, mobility and connectivity means. As the mobility means growing technology and speed, tourism more, uh, grow, because mainly tourism is not about leisure, it is about mobility. And we'll keep growing in mobility enormously. The key point is how sustainable we are, but we will keep moving around. So then we will have this contingency, these two years, and the people will keep growing on mobility. That for me, the for important message. Tourism is not in crisis. In two years' time, we'll be, we will have the same number and growing again. The thing is how we will be each territory on that race, right? Second slide, of course, the slide that the, the Professor Buhalis showed, um, uh, and I think it's clear that uh, never before uh, uh, we have had uh, such, a, such a dramatic, you know, uh, 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 lack of mobility, I would say, you know, lack of tourism, lack of mobility mainly, you know, but probably in 2004, 2002, you know, we would be there, right? The, the interesting thing as well is that the GDP has also has a dramatic, uh, you know, uh, down, but uh, the, 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 the real GDP worldwide and the forecast, it won't be, you know, uh, more than uh, minus uh, 12%, minus 15%, which is the highest level keeping tourism minus 80 percent right so it's a matter today of mobility problem rather than economic problem and even less we don't have a finance problem so the 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 the, the, the capacity to overcome you know the numbers we had two years ago definitely it will it will go it will come we won't or we don't want right 
Then I come to the second point, is that uh, what we are, we are exactly in the shift of the Industrial Revolution, right? As uh, Carlota Perez, that, that, that you might know, he's teaching in Tallinn, you know, he's pointing out, you know, the theory that uh, every 50 years we have an Industrial Revolution based on five phases. The first phase, you know, is the eruption of a new technology. The second phase is a gilded age, you know, France, you know, growing up, you know, these technologies apply to any kind of economy. The third phase is the turning point. It's where the previous technology, in our case, you know, the industrial technology, the industrial age is touching to the current age. You know, this turning point is where all the crises appear. We have an economic crisis. We have a labor crisis. Uh, we have a tech crisis. And we have a social crisis. So we are in this in this crisis. We're exactly in this moment. We are, you know, uh, uh, suffering a totally shift, you know, in a paradigm, a totally shift in the labor paradigm. And we go into that. Then, then you will come to the golden age. The golden age is mainly where the finances, where the money goes from one type of technology to, to another kind of technology. And second, when the law, when the rules are adapted. To the new technology. So rules have to adapt to how to face Airbnb, how to face Amazon, how to face eBay, how to face Google, how to face the problem of uh, intellectual property, you know, uh, personal uh, uh, information and so on. And the, when the legal, you know, the rules are shifted and changed to adapt to the new technology, then we come to the maturity while well, the new technology come in, the near phase coming, right? So we're exactly in this moment. What are the three technologies that are faced this are didn't start this year? You know, as you can imagine, green technology, efficient or sustainability is a debate that we have more than 20 years ago. So technology is there. You know, the only thing is that is for many people, for many businesses, we come from the industrial age, it's not feasible yet because they are still profiting, you know, the uh, investment they made in the previous age. Digital technology is something that is already ready, but it has to be, it has been, you know, the, the last one. And biomedical technology is also ready, you know, and suddenly we have the three great technologies that mainly green technology is a must. No tourists, no tourists, no tourists go to any destination because they are sustainable. The other way around. Any tourists in the future won't go to any destination if they are not sustainable. But they won't go there because they are sustainable. They won't go there because they are not sustainable. Everyone must be sustainable. This is a must. Um, this is a consciousness of the society already integrated. Digital technology may business grow. So this is exactly what business are oriented. Biomedical technology is a must, like sustainability, and even more from this year. So green technology and biomedical technology is something that destination has to be ready on, because otherwise no one will come. But this is a must. I tell you, the people won't come you know, here because you're sustainable or you are, or you are uh, uh, protected to, toward the COVID. They will come because they will really want to go to a fantastic destination, well managed, you know, very, very attractive to manage their time. Right. What's happened? You know, I like this picture very much because connect COVID with the beach. Right. What's happened this year? It's happened what every businessman and every financier people were expecting to. That we have a crisis that the people are conscious and suddenly the whole world are going to invest a bunch of money to make the shift from the industrial revolution to the new revolution, because Everyone know every hand that technology, but no one has has been able to finance the shift of paradigm. So now no one is complaining because suddenly the European Union is going to spend 772 billion euros to become more sustainable. The public is going to pay the bill and no one is going to complain because we are looking forward to go out of this crisis. So the public is going to pay the bill of sustainability. The public is going to pay the bill of digital technology growth. The public is going to pay the bill, you know that, of the biomedical advances. The public is going to pay. The public means all of us. And no one is going to complain. So it's not really you know, a crisis. It's an opportunity to make the shift from one side to the other, right? Said so, and I want to fit on time, and it's already 10, 10 minutes uh, long. I will go to, to tourism, right? 
So Spain's uh, 1.7, you know, 170 billion euro, you know. So now I would count how is going to be the shift of this new paradigm or how, how we focus, how we face, you know, this uh, new paradigm. For, of course, you know the you know, strategy of Copenhagen, the end of tourism as we know it, right? And uh, uh, the nice interesting things that, that they are facing, you know, in this strategy, and as we see it, that is going to blurry up, a blurry up the difference between a resident and a tourist. This is going to blurry up finally. We don't talk about tourists and we don't talk about residents. We talk about the people who move around the world. And if you change, if we shift this mentality, so that we will be able to face what is to come. And it will give some insight, right? For insight, it's definitely the platformation, you know, it's every technology, every business is becoming, you know, it's centralized, centralized with the platform. Platform is, you know, this uh, new technology connected with the internet that is connecting, you know, the digital world with the physical one. The most clear one is Amazon or Airbnb. You know, whatever is coming, you know, happening in the digital world, it has a direct, you know, a replication, a direct affection to the physical world. Everyone knows about the debate about uh, uh, Airbnb and short-term accommodation. Everyone knows what's happened, you know, with Amazon and the war, you know, with the local retails, right? So that it could be, you know, in Netflix, uh, you know, Airbnb, you know, and then we had the forecast, you know, to pay attention on tourists for the future. In 25, 25th, you know, 25th, 25% of the workforce, it will work remarkably, right? 25%. Uh, I, I will share the presentation so you can really go to the sources so you don't have to take notes on that, right? I mean, the second thing is that in 2030, right, 50% of the people, the active people won't have a job. The people won't have jobs, but they will have globally a basic income guaranteed. So you will have 50% of the active people that won't have job, so they will have more free time and they will have money to, to travel. Amazing. The number of tourists, the number of people who are going to move, you know, in 10 years time is going to increase even faster than the forecast are saying, right? But keep into account that 50% of the car will be driverless and that is gonna affect directly to the destination, right? Is that the ownership of the mobility is going to shift radically and the enormous amount of public space that we are going to free because of that is going to rethink destination concerning public space. It's a great opportunity, right? More insights, 1 billion people will be digital nomads by 2035. Digital nomad, 1 billion people. Now we are 9.8 billion people, sorry, 7.9 billion people in the world. So 1 billion people will be digital nomads. So they will be not living in one place, traveling around the world in different places. This is an enormous opportunity to tourism and accommodation industry. 27% of the workforce in major European city will be remote workers. So the people will work at home. The people will move some other city, but they will work at home. So the totally shift that is going to happen with the offices, the offices space at the urban destination will be amazed. The total shift that you're going to be in the parking space and to rethink the public space and the parking space will be amazing. Something that for urban planning we are already dealing with, right? More information 98 of people, 98 million jobs will be displaced and 97 million jobs will be created. It's going to be a radical shift in labor. 70% high new temporary staff, 45% outsourced business function to external. 45% hard freelancers. This is going to shift radically the labor force, radically, right? Average internet of speed is going to grow enormously. It's going to uh, uh, facilitate this kind of uh, uh, phenomena. Uh, well, the sixth generation of telephone, uh, the fastest, the, how it's going to uh, be faster, you know, the, the mobility means, you know, this is a graph, you know how the mobility, you know, between Berlin and Shanghai is, uh, growing, is getting down, you know, in time distance. And then that flow will have like a 75% less time because the new technology airplanes are faster than, than sound, right? 26% increase remotely. I would really, I already talk about that. And that's also very important. Historic and projected home ownership rate, you know, is that we are shifting from 2000 to 2050, 
it's not going to get even, you know, even to 50% ownership. What does it mean? The accommodation, accommodation and ownership and residence is going to blurry. Co-housing, co-living, co-sharing, you know, for all people, elderly people, new people, young people is going to enormously glow because the people are going to be moving the people are going to move for leisure for walking remote working and so on so it means that silo will have something that will never have before it that no one is going to distinguish what is you know a real estate platform or an airbnb platform is going to mix up so tourism is going to mix up with real estate uh, is going to is going to take the whole market as a one right so for me i'm going to end up you know the presentation showing the current you know, situation in Spain, which is very interesting. Uh, this, is a, this is a picture on from a, as a central section, right, of what current foreign tourists are in Spain, 2019. These are, you see the red, uh, the red areas, central section is the minimum element of administrative, you know, uh, as you know, administrative counting of people. It's around like a 1.3 uh, uh, thousand people, you know, per central section that are like, a, 30, 36,288 census section is paying. I'm finishing just one minute more. And, uh, and then you see here that the foreign tourists, which is uh, 94 million instead of the 82 million that uh, the Spanish government is saying, but I will not get into that, trust me. So foreign people are concentrating on the cost, Madrid, you know, Baleari Island. So this is the picture for the same, you know, distribution of the Spanish one, right? The Spanish tourist, which is a 193 million, and I won't talk about that, you know, it's around the whole, you know, uh, a country. You plus both, which indeed, instead of 82 million tourists in Spain, we have uh, 287 million tourists in Spain, if you plus the Spanish one, you will have this picture. I think in the future, definitely, the tourists are going to be concentrated on the urban destination, but it will more and more blurry in any other site instead of really on the leisure they used to. The last message, you know, I think we're shifting from the end of tourism to the end of citizenship. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Falcon, for this presentation. I'm sure many questions will also come up here. So uh, I would like to thank you once again, all four presenters for your contributions. And uh, now I would like to pass uh, uh, to Dr. Alavaize for the questions that we, you have already written to the chat. Thank you, Dr. Zerva, and uh, thank you all for your interesting presentation, actually. Um, I have some questions from the from from the participants, let's I will I will I will read the the, the question as we received from uh, the attendees. Uh, the first question is for Dr. Buhales from Stefano Di Cantis. What about the privacy issues in controlling pandemic with technologies using tracking at the international level? Pros and cons. Difficult question. Um, and the evidence actually shows that COVID doesn't like privacy. Uh, the countries that they've managed um, COVID and pandemics in the best possible way are those countries that they are putting less emphasis on privacy. China, Taiwan, Korea, uh, some of the countries that have done it. Having said that, I keep hearing about the privacy thing, and I'm, I'm, I'll ask um, the person who asked the question, do they use Facebook? Do they use Google? Do they, have they seen what Google Maps is collecting about them? Uh, all of these applications are collecting, how long did you go? Where did you go? How long did you stay? What kind of ice cream you had? I like pistachio ice cream, by the way, so people will know and I give G GDPR so people will know that I like pistachio. So what's happening is that a lot of people are concerned about privacy, but privacy is gone uh, with, with all the applications that we're using. We are keep providing information about our private life. Um, and it's a difficult one, uh, but effectively uh, a lot of, 
if you are flying, privacy is not there because a lot of people do not know that after September 11, when you go for a flight before you get your boarding pass, when you do check check in online, there is a six or seven seconds process where they are checking whether you're on the wanted list or whether you are free to fly. There are a lot of things that we do not know. Have a look on uh, what they call it, uh, the American um, uh, police kind of films, the uh, SSCI Miami or whatever, and, and you kind of understand. But actually, most of us, we almost have similar kind of tools to know what people are doing because we are all socially connected. Sorry, I know it's not a good answer, but that's the real answer. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Bradis. Actually, the, the privacy issues uh, is, is very important these days because of the using of uh, technologies and other, as you said, uh, social media right now is, is uh, uncovering us for the people. Uh, the second question is for Dr. Uh, uh, Salim. Uh, which of the mentioned measures uh, that you mentioned do you think are here to stay in the tourism sector in Egypt? Your mic, your mic is mute. As I talked about Egypt here, uh, we already did two studies here for one qualitative and one quantitative study about, uh, about Egypt. For Egypt, we have, uh, as I said, initiatives from the government and initi another initiative from uh, hotels itself. But the problem is nowadays, what about people or about travelers here? If we are talking about, I'm, I'm, if I'm sure, for international tourists when they are coming into Egypt, I think vaccination is the solution nowadays. For Egypt nowadays, they have a priority nowadays for all employee in tourism industry, starting from airports, from uh, in hotels and tourism companies to be vaccinated. And this is a very important here point here. And also from another perspective, if we are talking about, uh, about travelers themselves, they also should be vaccinated. So now we have maybe mutual community. So we have vaccinated travelers and we have vaccinated employee and tourism industry. So it is important here. So I think it will be more safer and I will be trusted for tourism here in this point. Okay, thank you, Dr. Islam. And uh, uh, the, the next, next question is for Dr. Arbolo. Uh, which of the proposed scenarios do you think will actually prevail in your opinion and why? Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, as I said, we start this research uh, in middle of 2020 when all this was starting. And so there was a lot of uncertainty about this. Uh, so we have this these four main scenarios. And right now with official data, we can say that uh, we were close. Actually, official data said that we are close to a scenario. We are between a scenario C and D. So which means that actually the model work. <laughs> so we are happy about that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arbolo. Uh, I will take a question for Mr. Falcon. Um, the question says, how should tourism destination management handle this new market demand or segment, such as digital nomads? Well, I mean, I would say that first, it's not a task from only destination, it's a task for any city. It's a, it's a blurry app. It's not going to be destination versus it's going to be simply, you know, a kind of mobility. Mm -hmm. The second thing that already experienced on that, uh, I think Gran Canaria, it's uh, one of the cities which is uh, leading, you know, this kind of uh, 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 gaze or view on this new mobility people, right? And they are making quite well. Definitely, they, they have a totally different logic that the uh, accommodation as uh, we know it 
uh, they have uh, totally different needs. There is a fantastic, you know, a, a web page that is uh, somehow uh, profiling these people and giving a lot of data for any kind of destination worldwide. That is uh, called Nomad List. It's a nice web page, you know, exactly to profile these people. But I think it's simply, you know, you have to face that as you face any kind of a profile any kind of segment, luxury segment, uh, uh, gay segment, uh, uh, let it be, right? Or, or any kind of segment, they, they have their needs. I simply have to face that. It depends on how you really want to specialize your, your destination to focus that, yeah? But they, they are an enormous growing market, very feasible, very well educated with a lot of money, um, keeping the gun, they have, you know, average income worldwide, amazing, you know, and they really like to travel on those places where the money is more feasible for them. So it's an enormous opportunity worldwide. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Falcon. Actually, we, I don't know, do we have, Emilia, do we have another, uh, do you have a time for another? I question? think that if we can steal another some minutes more to the speaker, uh, we have some more questions, very brief, but uh, if it is possible for you, it would be great. Thank you. Um, I have another question actually for Dr. Bohales from Golan's Hagdadi. Uh, the question is, I want to ask Dr. Bohales that in your opinion, the best solution for COVID-19 pandemic is a smart tourism. Is it smart? Is, is it smart tourism is the, the solution for pandemic? What do, you, what do you think? I think the, the best solution for COVID is to stay alive. <laughs> <laughs> and to stay alive, it's quite complicated right now. And I think you need to be resilient. And you need to be resilient both as a business and as a uh, individual. And uh, to stay alive, you need to take uh, care in terms of the health situation. So not uh, bring uh, danger to yourself and to others. Because the problem is that it's not only that you commit suicide if you're doing the, the stupid thing, but you're actually killing a lot of other people. It's a weapon. It's a war. And I think, it's, it, I think I'm getting a little bit tired of, of explaining to people that it's not about let's go back to what we were doing um, and understand what are the challenges are. So we need a range of different tools to actually stay alive to begin with in terms of the health situation and then stay alive in terms of uh, the financial situation and the tsunami that's coming forward. I think Louis uh, raise a whole range of things. I, I probably agree with 67% of what you're saying, but I fully agree with the fact that the future will be different from the past. And when you're traveling to the East and Far East in China, in many different developing communities, you are just seeing a whole range of different things that are happening there. And I think a lot of people in Europe, in, in some traditional kind of markets, we have not really, we are very complacent. Egypt is the same thing, you know? Um, you go to Egypt and people say, we've been here thousands of years. The Greeks are exactly the same. But a lot of the, a lot of the guys in, in, in the East, they, they go uh, far in, um, in, they are growing so fast because they've got to grow so fast. And they're using all kinds of new innovations to do so. Having said that, we have got a whole range of tools and we've got a lot of experience. I'll go back to it because I love the country and my good, there's nobody better in the world to do crisis management for tourism than the previous minister of tourism in Egypt, Hissam Zazua. Hissam has actually dealt with so many crises in, in, in tourism that nobody else has ever done. Okay, so there is expertise on those things. But what we need to do is we really need to, to bring all this expertise together. Uh, I admire people who are trying to do predictions and look into the impact of those things. I think most of the methodologies do not apply because most of the methodologies have been developed to do research in a kind of normal kind of environment, in a situation that you're controlling five or six things and then you're looking into one thing. But if you have got seven or eight things that they're all in transformation at the same time, we're going through a paradigm shift and we're going through 
uh, uncharted waters. So be very, very careful when you're talking about impacts. We cannot really talk about impacts because there are so many different things that are happening together. So that's why it's a long answer to, to a short question, but that's why we really need to go back to agility and to look into things in real time and take all the parameters together. I really love airlines and, and how it operates. So you can always say, what's the impact if I lose, uh, if I lose an engine? And you can do the modeling and you can find all kinds of things. What, what's the impact of if you're losing an engine? But if I tell you that the uh, wind is different, you are running out of petrol and you've got a fire at the back of the cabin, the situation is very different. So be careful in those who are doing research on, on those things, what you are actually researching uh, for. And be careful in looking to one solution to do things. I was just, I was just reading uh, a couple of days ago, something that's called the Swiss cheddar, uh, the Swiss cheese approach, and it was on the BBC, because it said, look, a cheese has got different holes, and that is stopping COVID may go to from one hole, but may stop in another one. So what we need to do is we really need to look to a whole range of different tools that we've got, all the experience that we've got, all the technology that we've got, all the cultural background we've got, all the situation, the context analysis we've got, and create solutions, context-specific solutions. What is happening in Yeda is very different to what's happening in Mallorca. It's very different what's happening to Aswan. It's very different what's happening in Xilocastro. You really need to be able to understand societies. You really need to, we need to go back to basics and look into resources. We need to look into needs and we need to redesign societies. And we need to redesign societies, not to go back, but to go forward to 2030, 20, look into what would we like. Yesterday, I was doing a, a very similar thing for in Rhodes in Greece. And I was talking to hotel managers. And I said, everybody would like to go back to 2019. But did we really like 2019? Was 2019 excellent? Or can we do things in order to learn and actually be ready for 2030? And it's a mindset change. And that's why I showed you this picture with a with mirror. Please do not drive looking at the mirror. You're going to have an accident. I tell you that. Drive by looking forward and making sure that you understand what are the conditions of the road ahead. And if you are using uh, methods to actually analyze the road, analyze, analyze the whole perspective of the road, get all the information together and have a holistic kind of approach to doing that. Thank you, Dr. Lovales. Um, actually, I would like to apologize for the, the, all people that uh, we have another two or three questions, but actually we don't have time. So uh, uh, we will remain the questions uh, for the, uh, the other questions for the, the, the speakers. Um, I don't know if we, we can we can share the the contact information for the speakers and you can contact the speaker. Um, I mean, any, anyone have, has a question, he can or she can uh, contact the speaker directly to ask about his or uh, his presentation. Mohamed, concerning the privacy, I give my permit to give my email. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Falco. <laughs> okay, um, it's, it's time to end uh, this interesting webinar. Um, actually, but, before ending, let me uh, let me thank all of you, the speakers, Dr. Bihalis, Mr. Falcon, Dr. Arbolo, and Dr. Salim for being with us today. It, uh, it was very interesting uh, presentations. It was very interesting discussion. Uh, and at the end, uh, let me thank Dr. Zerva actually for her efforts to arrange all of the. Uh, uh, coordinations and the contacts between the speakers and also Emilia has uh, done a great job uh, for uh, coordinating and uh, organizing this webinar. I don't know, Dr. Zerva, if you uh, would like to say anything before we finish? 
Just for my part, I would like also to thank all four presenters for being here today, uh, for sharing their knowledge and their expertise in this in this topic. Uh, just to say also that this session has been, as you know, um, audio taped, so you can all find it um, on the Google, uh, I'm sorry, on the YouTube uh, channel of Unimed. So everybody that wants to listen again, uh, what our panelists have said, of course, they have the chance and their answers to the particular questions. And if there are any few further questions or if you want their um, presentations, please comment contact us and we will send you uh, the information you need. From my part, thank you all. Be safe, be well, and hope to see you uh, soon in another occasion. Thank you. Thank you all for having me here. Thank, thank you, you to the me. coordinators and, and to the speak, the panelists. Have a nice day. Have a nice thank day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.